You know, speaking of Dragon Con, uh, this was a big event for me. Uh, this I was a guest at the first Dragon Con, and many since really? then. Um, but I've been doing this for about 30 years, and this 25th anniversary of Dragon Con is also my 250th convention. Congratulations! That's that's amazing. How did you survive 250 conventions? He was stupid. No, it's not that at all. <laughs> it's um, it's the fact that I just I, I, I love the fans so much, and and he you, was young and full of energy and stupid. And and now <laughs> I'm not so young. <laughs> and we are not going to make it a trifecta, are we? <laughs> no, it, it, it's really the honest truth of it is that that I just love being with the fans. Uh, I love talking with aspiring writers and artists and giving them advice. And it exhausts you. And it, it exhausts does. me. It does, but it's a good kind of exhaustion. But this is why we only do two conventions a year now. Yeah, well, we're kind of old and creaky and parts are falling off, mm -hmm. but uh, no, we've done this all the way to, to Australia and back, and, and it's just an invigorating experience, too. Mm -hmm. I know there's a tremendous uh, energy with the convention. The wonderful thing is that that you can you can meet a shy young writer one year, and then you give them a little advice. Then you see them again another year, and then a few years down the line, they're on a panel with you because they've made it. You know, mm -hmm. it's wonderful to be able to. Uh, uh, to, to lend some of our own, you know, hard knocks and experience. Uh, the, the, the saying is that experience is what you get immediately after you needed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> Absolutely. But we can share some of our own experiences and, uh, and help some folks along with their dreams. You mentioned earlier that you are not really well known for science fiction, much less metahuman science fiction. Yes, but you haven't left fantasy, and in fact, I believe... Oh, not even close. Yeah, I believe you've got a new 500 Kingdoms book coming out. That'll uh, be November. Beauty and the Werewolf? Mm hmm Can you tell our viewers a little bit about the book? Well, all the 500 Kingdoms books are generally an intersection of several fairy tales. Mm hmm So this is a intersection of Beauty and the Beast and many, many, many werewolf tales and Little Red Riding Hood. And kind of what happens when they all collide and the people involved are not in the least interested in following the, tr the path that the tradition dictates to them, which is the case for all of the 500 Kingdoms books. Yes, uh, I remember the first one sort of kind of dealt with, if I recall correctly, Cinderella. And then the second one mm -hmm. was per uh, Perseus and Andromeda with a twist. Yes. Yeah. And then we uh, managed to collide the Siegfried legends with uh, Sleeping Beauty. I missed that one. That Darn. It was actually called Sleeping Beauty, and it's poor Siegfried. Well, this is a Siegfried that actually knows about the tradition because when he stuck his finger in the dragon's blood and licked it and he could understand what the bird was saying to him, he listened to the bird and he believed it because he's not a big dumb barbarian. Well, And he really did, although he enjoyed the heroing part, he did not like the dying horribly part at all. So he has been in this book running across many kingdoms attempting to avoid the woman in armor sleeping in the circle of flame, which keeps popping up in his path. No matter, <laughs> no matter what he does. What he does. Yes. But it sounds like yours is much better than Wagner's. Oh, he, he, I, I adore this guy. He is, he is such a sweetheart. And he just he keeps listening to the bird, and the bird keeps giving him very good advice. Uh, but I'm trying to remember how I phrased this. Most re the reaction to b by most heroes to a, to a bird talking to them would be either to kill it and eat it or ignore it and Siegfried listen to it. What are you involved with right now? Writing and art? Well, goodness. Um, I, do, uh, I do several short stories every year, and uh, the latest one that I've done for the next Valdemar anthology for uh, Daw Books... December. Yeah, December. Is uh, is a change of pace rather than doing one of my uh, one of my usual Griffin stories, which mm -hmm. people just love. Uh, I've skipped it for this anthology to do a designer's notes 
essay. It's a long essay. It's a long essay that shows basically uh, the the amount and types of research that go into uh, developing things for our Valdemar books. Uh, as we say, we have four pages of notes for two lines in the book, and uh, this gives people a chance to see how we reason all of this together and the actual, uh, you know, the the science that goes into uh, into the books, uh, the the study of the physics of how this or that works, uh, and uh, all the way to the calculus that I had to do, you know, just for working on some of the magic field stuff. And uh, oh, fans no. don't get to see this sort of thing. Be fair, you didn't do the calculus. You emailed Jim Cacalius. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jim Cacalius is a, is a wonderful scientist and friend who uh, we can always fact check things with. And so I talked with him and Ed Pegg over at Wolfram Mathematics and uh, made sure that I had all of this right. So The secret to being a, a writer is that you don't have to know everything. You just have to know who does know everything. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a nice change of pace for the fans. Uh, but I started in the field as a book cover artist, and I'm still doing covers. Uh, oddly enough, I wound up as the series editor on the Secret World Chronicles, but also the cover artist. How odd is that for a combination? Yeah, and now we have to figure out what's going, what the, the Nazi death machine is going to be for the cover of the third one, because yeah. we've done the eagle, we've done the wolf, and I think we'll be damned if I'm going to create any more robotic beasties. Well, see, now I'm going to run out of things to paint. That's right. No, you aren't. I'll just have to have, an, you know, insert bad guy here on the cover. <laughs> Yeah, this I was a funny think, thing. I because still think you should do a death sphere. We were we were about to we were about to you know pitch on well you know maybe I could do the covers for this and and uh, you know Tony Weisskopf who was the it was the the publisher says well we'll just get Larry to do the covers oh, well that was a quick gig okay <laughs> I'll go with that that's cool well you know when you're kind of in the same household as as you know the the lead on the team and. They figure that you're going to know the material, and that's yeah. how it works. They figure you're going to know the material, and not only that, you've got such a track record as an artist, they know that you will deliver a product they can use. Which well, I appreciate that. I mean, uh, I've built a reputation on reliability, and, uh, you know, I consider my work to be moderately good, but you can certainly count on me, and, you know, and that's a big thing in the field. Uh, I'm doing a uh, architecturally doing a redesign and uh, and new build on my studio, and that's taking up a lot of time. Uh, and then I've got the car projects and things like that. But we also do the uh, you know the the aviculture and uh, the raptor rehab. Yeah, we don't do the raptor rehab anymore. No, oh. we we have a, a new group moved into the county, and uh, they've got a five hundred one c and a great lab and way more resources than we had. Yeah. And we're getting too old to climb into trees. Um, but you you do have birds, I believe. Uh, we have we way that. too many parrots. Yeah. Way, way too Your many Your feathered parrots. children. They yes. are wonderful. They are wonderful. And the peacocks. And I have five peacocks. Mm -hmm. And Larry is the custodian for a local falconer for her barna, uh, barna, barna. Barna. <laughs> for, for her great horned owl, which she doesn't want to have around anymore because it takes up space in her muse that she could have for a, a, a hunting bird as opposed to an old cranky great horned owl who knows very well that that half a quail is coming along regularly as clockwork and is not interested in in working for it anymore. Yeah. Right. Cheyenne knows that she's getting fed whether uh, whether she goes out hunting or not. So <laughs> it is kind of surreal to to have birds of prey figure so prominently in the stories and the artwork. Uh, and you know, and then there's a great horned owl here in your studio hanging out. She is actually in your studio. That's oh right. yes. That's right. Oh yes. We uh, no wonder you need a redesign. <laughs> well, we discovered a, a very interesting thing, which is if you if you keep your bird inside, you do not in, legally in Oklahoma have to build a muse. Yeah. Oh. So we keep her inside, and she's perfect. Got her own section of the studio. It's all good. And she hoots to Frank Sinatra. That's right. Oh, I love it. I love it. She loves old blue eyes. That's right. Uh, well, hopefully the claws won't get anywhere near them. Uh, <laughs> it's it's funny sometimes, you know. We have these these folks in our books called the Hawk Brothers, and uh, uh, I used to have a, a red tailed hawk, and uh, she would sit on the back of my chair and preen my hair while I was doing Hawk Brothers art. You know? oh. <laughs> while all this is going on, you know, you've got all of these projects going on. Um, 
you've decided to sign up for a paying forward project, yes. Misty, uh, aka Sith Lord and Apprentice. No, no, that's not what you I was afraid you wouldn't say that. But could you tell us a little bit about the the oh, Stellar Guild? Well, Brendan contacted me on this because he knows I I have these protégés. And I actually had two candidates, but I decided to go with Cody, although I'd be perfectly happy to sign up for the second one as well. Um, it is a novella and a novelette, mm -hmm. supposed to be set in the same universe, same... Secret world. Same characters. This is not, no, it's not Secret World. This is oh. something entirely different. Oh, okay. The whole point is that you're, th is that you set, set, have the same setting, possibly some or all of the same characters, and the protege writes the shorter piece, and the mentor writes the longer piece. And Cody and I are doing something that the whole project is being called Reboots. And as absurd as this sounds, this is our Zombies in Space. Okay. <laughs> that sounds fascinating. Well, but I'll simply say that Assume that you have no FTL, mm -hmm. and you have zombies and other supernatural creatures, of w over which the normals have a considerable hold. Mm -hmm. You wish to explore outer space. You have no FTL. Who do you Who better do you put on spaceships? So the, s the ships are loaded full of zombies as the expendable labor, the, and a a or t a couple werewolves and a couple of vampires, vampires, and the werewolves serve as the food supply for the vampires, as well as crew. Mm -hmm. And the vampires are crew, and they are virtually immortal, and you just send them out to explore and find exploitable planets. And you don't have to worry as much about shielding the ship because the radiation problem is taken care of by your um by the fact that they regenerate. So right. Well. So that that solves a lot of problems. Solves a lot of problems. Yes. Is there anything you all would like to add? Oh, I think it's just important to remember uh, for for every every professional that might be watching this, every aspiring professional, every uh, talented amateur that sees this, is to remember that sometimes all somebody needs from you is to be taken seriously for a little while. You know, it was. Uh, around 30 years ago that Anne McCaffrey and Michael Whalen spent a few minutes just taking me seriously and listening to me and I decided this is the field I want to work in as a result of that and so we always make time for people and if there's anything I wanted to tell you make time for the folks that that have a love for the same field that you're working in and uh, you know they're not just the future of the field you know, you're handing them your own legacy as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and as for me, I would say the thing that you have to remember is if you don't write or paint or draw or do what you love, it shows. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing the Secret World stuff and is a project that is very close to my heart. I mean, not, I, not that I don't love all the fantasy, not that I don't love Valdemar that I do for Daw, or the Elvin Bain books that I do for Tor, or anything else. I do love them, but all you, you really need to have something that really sends the joy juice through you <laughs> to keep you going. That's right. As we say, if you're, if you're not doing a job that you do for free, then you're doing the wrong job. What a great closer. Thank you both. And thank you viewers from BuzzyMultimedia.com.